Hey, my name is Kyle Sigmund, and I am a part of a band called Seeking Gravity, and you are watching the Chana 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 podcast. Hey, my name is Kyle Sigmund, and I am a part of a band called Seeking Gravity, and you are watching the Chana 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 podcast. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of my podcast. We have a very special guest today joining all the way from North Carolina. We got Kyle Sigmund joining the podcast. Hi Kyle. Hey there, thanks for having me. Yeah, so how are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good, yeah. Um, we've uh, just had a nice dinner with my family and the, my kids are in the other room playing some video games. Uh, Y'all might hear them, but uh, they're having a good time, so. <laughs> right. So, so Kyle, tell me a little bit about where, where are you from, uh, which city, and also tell us about how, what is the situation over there with, you know, with the pandemic and everything? Yeah, so um, I live in the mountains of North Carolina, the Appalachian Mountains. Um, they say it's some of the oldest mountains in the world, so they're not uh, real, real tall and, and pointy. They're kind of like rolling hills, but it's, you know, about 3,000 square, uh, 3,000, 3, you know, miles uh, above sea level. Uh, it's a small, but you, it's a university town. So the college kind of brings, um, you know, some people to this area. Um, I, I absolutely love it here. We, I've, I've lived here pretty much my whole life. Um, we're pretty much two hours from any really big city. Uh, we're in lots of directions, um, but we're up in the northwest part of, of North Carolina. And uh, our kids have been in school for a couple weeks now. They do get to go. It's not virtual. They're going in person. They have to wear a mask every day. Um, you know, my, my, my daughter, who is in uh, fifth grade, did have to stay home for a week because uh, they told her that she was near someone who tested positive, but mm. as, as long as she tests negative on Monday, she can go back to school on Tuesday. Uh, there's been no symptoms or anything like that, but, but there, it's definitely affecting our lives. Uh, I know people, uh, the hospitals are actually pretty overwhelmed right now over here and, you know, we, we got to take it seriously. Right. So, so Kyle, I know also you're, you're a pastor as well. So, so how is, how is the pandemic affected like your church and congregation? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm the associate pastor at Faith Bridge United Methodist Church in Blowing Rock, which is just a town close by to me. And yeah, I mean, ever since March of 2020, things have just been drastically different. I mean, we've done a lot of worship services over Zoom We've done a lot of worship services outside and mm. only recently over, you know, did we have start having any services inside and it was a small group masked distanced, you know, uh, and because of it, I, you know, I, I feel like we, we haven't seen as many people face to face and there's been a lot more uh, internet interaction and, and things like that. Even small groups meeting with, with zoom, and that sort of thing, but it's, it's definitely changed how we do ministry and uh, even how much I go to the office versus stay at home and call people uh, versus visiting them, that, that sort of thing, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's, 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 it still feels good because people still go to church, even virtually, they, they still try to congregate, right? But, but in a way, it's kind of sad that you cannot really have that connection that you would have in a normal church situation right in a church yeah yeah it's definitely been tough I mean especially you know people want to like see each other in real life and give each other hugs and that sort of thing and we're always afraid to like even shake hands you know you're kind of like doing the elbow thing or the knuckles right. or something yeah you're afraid to to really have that personal touch with each other because you don't want to spread anything right so as a musician and a, you know you you perform regularly so how is the performing impacted from the from the pandemic where when did you last perform live um so 
thankfully during the summer with the with the weather as it is we've been able to do some outdoor things uh actually my band uh played uh an outdoor um kind of house party thing uh, just a couple weeks ago and since we were outside and distance we felt we felt pretty safe you know doing that uh there's been a couple times where um when i've done some solo shows just my singer songwriter stuff where I actually was asked to, to sing in a mask and mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, a little difficult, a little harder to breathe, a little harder to, uh, and then when you're playing guitar and it kind of starts slipping down, it's really hard to kind of adjust it and, and keep singing and playing. Um, but I understand the safety precautions and I just kind of had to, to chuck, truck on through and I was thankful to still have the opportunity to play some live music. Um, even, even then, uh, I just had to wear a mask. Right. <clears throat> like you, you, you said you have, you have five kids and uh, how, how did the pandemic, uh, because you, you probably stayed home <clears throat> more time now because of the pandemic. So how did it affect the, you know, the relationship with the kid and wife and family? You know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like a challenge, but also a blessing, you know, it's like, uh, it is a blessing to have extra time together as a family. But it is a, such a challenge too to try to have some type of normalcy with, with work and you know especially um, doing anything kind of creative. I, I like to have a, a peaceful, quiet atmosphere so I can kind of think clearly. And that's that's a lot harder when there's seven people in the house uh, plus the three pets. And um, <laughs> it, it, what's really interesting is so March of 2020. Is, is when our, our foster daughter, who we are in the process of adopting, she literally moved in with us like about a week before everything shut down. So we were, you know, expecting her, you know, to have her days at the high school, her afternoons and evenings with her lacrosse team, you know, evenings with the dance team, you know, we, we kind of thought, well, this will be great because we all have lots of things we're involved in and doing and so, but it was like all of a sudden the world shut down and all seven of us were just in our house all the time. And again, it was, it was kind of both a challenge mm. and, and a blessing. Um, but it, yeah, I, that was when I got really serious about having some kind of exercise routine that got me out of the house. I started running a lot more. Right. Um, so I'm actually training for a half marathon right now. So I've, I've, I've logged a lot of miles and I'm, um, that's that's been a way for me to have something to, to get out into nature to kind of clear my head and and kind of you know get some exercise as well right <laughs> yeah because uh, what i've been doing also i don't really run but i walk so i've been doing those uh, virtual virtual runs right like I, I would do like 200 km every month just walking a little bit every day like maybe 10 kilometers every day uh, I think even though 2020 was the, there was a lockdown, I think in 2020, I actually walked more than 2019 because there was, that's the only thing I could do because there's nothing else to do. Just go outside and walk and buy the groceries and I would just walk. There was no, here in the Philippines, the lockdowns were quite serious. So we didn't have public transport. So everything has to be done work. There was no taxis anymore. Everything was stopped. So I would just get a, recycle bag and I would just walk to the grocery store like just just doing like you know getting my exercise while <laughs> getting some <laughs> groceries it, it was yeah. kind of it was kind of kind of getting scarier in early in the 2020 like like March April because we started seeing certain supplies were getting disappeared on the shelves and then if I if I go into the grocery store, I could see, oh, wow, there's some cookies there. I, I like I will try to buy it because it's you, I, I would last week I didn't see it. So but now I think we are, I think a lot of places now sort of found found the rhythm of, you know, this uh, having a lockdown. But, you know, life goes on. So, yeah, it, it was really helpful for me to do do the walking. It cleared my mind and also gave me some physical, you know, probably build my immunity also that's why I, I i was i i luckily i didn't get that you know the wires right so yeah for sure for sure and you know 
it was just important. I think it was important just for my mental health to have something, something like that to, to do for sure. Right. <clears throat> so Kyle, tell me a little bit about your childhood and uh, what's your earliest uh, memory of music? Yeah. So my parents, um, they really enjoyed the classic rock and the singer songwriter type stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful for that because they introduced me to the Beatles when I was very young. Um, and I still absolutely love the Beatles. I mean, I just think that some of those songs are just um, timeless. And I love to cover a lot of the Beatles songs, even still when I, when I play. Uh, also, Simon and Garfunkel, uh, James Taylor, you know, that type singer-songwriter stuff, um, Fleetwood Mac, um, and those, you know, Fleetwood Mac, I remember hearing the song Landslide and thinking, I want to know how to play that on guitar, you know, it's just such a uh, cool, like, finger-picking type thing, and again, that's what's one I, I tend to cover a lot when I play out uh, and about, because it, it's, a, it's a real fun one to play on guitar, and so, yeah, I was, I, um, I was always really attracted to music, I remember as a kid, even kind of sometimes listening to music and almost visualizing kind of almost like the melody or like how notes would kind of go up and down on a, on the, on a page. I could kind of see what I was hearing, if that makes sense. And, and so I've always really relied heavily on my ear to, uh, when I started playing guitar in around middle school, um, it was mostly self-taught. It was mostly listening to things and figuring out how to play them. And, course we didn't have youtube back then so i wasn't able to just pull up videos like we can now uh i had to use my ear but i think that was i think i was that was good for me because it, it forced me to to struggle with it a little bit right I, I yeah i remember that that back in the day even getting a even getting a guitar tab book was not easy right and it, it was also it was quite expensive those days those books right like guitar tabs and chord chord books and stuff yeah, and you could find some tablature online sometimes, right. but, um, you know, tab is not, I'd never enjoyed really reading tab. <laughs> it was, uh, I don't know, it, it was easier for me almost sometimes to just listen to the song over and over again until I figured it out. Right. Yeah, one thing with the, with the Beatles is that uh, Beatles, like, for me, it's like they, they ask, their, their music is, in a way, that it's very simple, but but it's also very complex as well. If you if you really want to dig deep, it can become complex. But if you just want to simply enjoy, it can be just a simple song, right? Yeah, and I just I love their career, how they you know uh, it got experimental and did some kind of interesting things. Uh, right. You know that when I as I got older like middle school I, I was really into the 90s grunge alternative type stuff and so Kurt Cobain and Nirvana you know what I loved about him was he wasn't necessarily following the rules of music right. theory he just was doing something very unique with the guitar and his you know the energy that he brought to his music um, and that that really stood out to me as like just something that really resonated with me. Um, you know, I, I remember, even when I first started playing guitar, you know, I learned a power chord and I thought, this is all I need because <laughs> I can play every single Nirvana song now. And this is, a, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kyle, did you hear the news that about the Nirvana Nevermind album cover, the, the kid is suing <laughs> the band? <laughs> I, I did see that, and I, I'm baffled by that, considering he's posed, he's recreated that pose so many times since then. Right. You know, he's got, never mind, tattooed on his chest. Like, it seems like he's kind of embraced it. Now, all of a sudden, I mean, did some lawyer come up to him and say, hey, let's, I, I can get you a lot of money if I can get a cut of it. You know, I'm just, right. I'm just wondering, what, right. what made him think, now, all of a sudden, right, now he feels exploited. I'm 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 confused by that, but yeah, I have heard about that. Yeah, and I and it it's kind of worrying me because you know this this can open up a whole set of this uh, 
you know like there might be so many album covers questionable right like art and photos that they used so which which was like in the back in the day it was it was accepted okay it, it was accepted at art right so but now with, with i i think with the culture right now like ev- everybody sort of get offended by anything or they will they will they will try to look for something to be offended really i think that's the real real thing so it it kind of worries me because especially like you know with mac metal rock and you know the albums that that came up there there are a lot of uh, sort of ob- objectional sort of covers right which was like cool also and, <laughs> and accepted by everybody before so this can open up yeah. a lot of problems <laughs> for sure for sure and of course you know the point of an album cover is to get people's attention but right. you know and even knowing what i know about kurt cobain and, and that band like they in no way would be actually like exploiting a child for sexual reasons right like right. it's ridiculous i mean you know you can watch videos on youtube of kurt stopping in the middle of a song and yelling at some dude who was groping a a, a, a woman and, right. and saying if you're gonna if you're gonna do that i'm gonna kick you out of here so obviously like consent and like appropriate behavior actually was something that they cared about so yeah <laughs> right yeah it it's it, it, it's kind of like because although like you know the grunge era they were considered sort of like social outcasts like you know those grunge, grunge bands but but they 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 did have that qualities of them right they they really uh loved the fans they really cared about the society and things right although they were considered as like outcasts because of the way they what music they prepared and and stuff like that right mm, for sure for sure yeah so yeah, another so, yeah go ahead i was going to say another band that i um have have really enjoyed over the years is radiohead right um because of I, I, you know, this is going back to how the Beatles kind of started to experiment a little bit. You know, no one's done that more than Radiohead, starting off with kind of, you know, a pretty typical 90s rock band sound with uh, songs like Creep. But then, you know, with, with uh, Kid A, you know, really branching out and, and doing some, some interesting things. Uh, I was actually just listening to uh, that album today and remembering, you know, just... You know, I, I love it when bands really kind of don't feel like they have to conform to something, but can can really explore different different ideas and different sounds. Yeah, Kid Day, and I I think there was another one called OK Computer, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's the one I think that had just come out when I really uh, I was really getting into them a lot. Yeah, I love right. that album. So 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 Kyle, we. When when are you picking up the guitar? Like, were you studied the guitar at school, or how did you like get into playing guitar? Yeah, I uh, like I said earlier, it was mostly by ear. I did have a few people kind of show me a few things. Um, I had a brother in law who could play guitar. I had uh, some older guys at the church who could play guitar. And once I kind of learned some basic chords and, and realized I had an ear for it, I, I just kind of, it just became what I did in my room. Like I just was constantly, you know, playing, figuring out songs and, uh, and pretty quickly actually in, in middle school and into high school, uh, I started playing at church in the youth group and then even for kind of helping lead worship in, at the early service. And so I, it quickly got put to use, which which really helped me feel like, um, you know, I could do something with this. It's not just for me, but I can kind of share this this gift, and that that really felt felt good. It, it made me feel like I could offer something. And um, I, oddly enough, I never even had a, a real lesson until I was in college, when I decided to minor in music. Right. And in order to in order to get into the music department, I had to show up and um, audition. And I was auditioning to to play classical guitar, and I'd never played classical guitar, so I, I borrowed someone's nylon string guitar. I had a friend who who had taken lessons his whole life, 
come over one afternoon and teach me two songs. I was like, just make it, you know, teach me something simple that but makes it look like I know what I'm doing. So he like <laughs> taught me, he taught me like, you know, this is, a, this is what you do. You know, you put your foot up on the stool and you, you use your fingers. And I mean, he just, it was literally one afternoon. He just kind of, right. and I, I mimicked him and I was like, was that pretty much it? And he was like, yeah, that, that was it. And somehow I, I fooled the university into uh, getting me into the school of music there. <laughs> and so that was, that was when I actually, uh, to get my degree, I had to have some, some lessons with, with classical guitar. So that was the first, the first time I had any guitar lessons. Right. <laughs> so um, how is the songwriting comes up? Like, how, when did you sort of decided or oh, to write your own songs that you want to really pursue writing your songs? Yeah. Well, I think I really started doing it a little bit in high school, but I didn't have a great way to remember what I was writing. So I would write songs and think, oh, that's great. And then like the, the week later, I would try to remember what, what did I just do? I have no idea what I did. Um, but, but eventually, um, at first, the songs I was writing would be like um, – something that I felt like I could use in some way. So like I started writing songs that we could use in church, um, you know, and then in college I wrote songs that we, so, so let me back up and say too, um, as I was graduating high school as an 18 year old, I actually got hired to lead worship for a ch church. So, um, so they hired me as an 18 year old going into college. I, I had this part-time job as a worship leader and I did that all through all through college, um, so that gave me a platform to every once in a while kind of bring something new that I had written to um, the co a congregation. But to be honest, I, I really, I almost I don't know I almost felt like a closet songwriter for a really long time because you know it's really vulnerable to to share things and and it also is. Um, you know, I didn't actually record anything until uh, after I finished seminary. So I had gone to college and then uh, graduate. I, I was actually, it, there was five years in between my undergrad and my seminary degree. And then it wasn't until after seminary that I basically had this kind of burst of creative energy and ended up writing well, the project that became the Songs from the Mount, which is Jesus's Sermon on the Mount put to songs. So I wrote like 16 songs in a matter of two weeks. And so when that happened, it was like, I should do something with this. You know, this is, I did, a lot of times songwriting was just for me because it was almost, it was a creative outlet. It was something I enjoyed doing. Um, but then when, when I did, when that happened, I felt like, you know, maybe, maybe these songs need to be shared. So I first shared them with my faith community. We uh, kind of did some studying of the Sermon on the Mount and I would sing the songs with the, the scripture and the sermon. Um, and then eventually I recorded them in three EPs because it was three chapters of, of scripture. Um, right. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, it's interesting how you can you can kind of know deep down, like I, I viewed myself as a songwriter almost before I had written many songs. It was just something that I wanted to do, that I liked doing. I would rather create something new than play a cover, uh, honestly. So it's just, I had to get to a point of kind of confidence of like, this is worth sharing kind of thing. Right. And as soon I mean, as I started, it's it's like, I, you know, then, I, then you kind of catch the bug and you just keep going. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I, I mean, I feel that Sermon of Sermons of the Mount was like Jesus, like most important, uh, you know, sermon, right? Like he probably shared the most important message, I believe. Uh, I think what he said, like, uh, love your neighbor as as a, like you love yourself. I think that was the main message, love, love God and love your neighbor. As, like, I think that came out Sermons of the Mount, right? 
yeah the golden rule you know yeah. treat others as you want to be treated yeah and you know that's also where jesus says you know don't just love your neighbor but even love your enemies right, you know? right. and that's just that um you know that that still is one of my most popular songs on youtube because uh a lot of churches uh they preach the electionary so it's like predetermined scripture passages over three years and inevitably this the scripture about loving your enemies is something that a, a lot of churches will be preaching but there's not a lot of songs about that because right. there's not a lot of songs that make you feel uncomfortable you know songs typically especially christian contemporary christian songs are always uh make you feel good and i think that was one of the things that i was really excited about doing with the sermon on the mount is because jesus steps on our toes like jesus makes us feel uncomfortable by by asking us to do more than what we just want to do you know loving our enemies is is a challenge but that is the only way to make the world a better place is to to step up and do the hard things and and to live a life of love is not just loving the people that are easy to love so yeah right. that's uh that's one of the reasons why people people find that song because they're like are there any songs about loving our enemies let me google that let me see if there's anything on youtube and i i it's funny i get people contacting me from australia and all over the world saying hey can i get a chord chart for for this song and i'm like yes please thank you for using it right because i i also felt because i actually listened to that even this morning that that song um one line that it said what i felt is that just loving the people you know you're not growing from that right you're just there so that's why you need to love learn to love your enemies or people you don't agree with or you know who challenges you so that's where the personal growth also right faith and personal growth will that that growth comes out of that that's that's really beautiful line that 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 really got me also that when i was listening to that song yeah for sure yeah that's awesome thank you <clears throat> So Kyle so I I got to know about you uh I interviewed uh Jed Brewer who is also another who's also a Christian musician I feel from Chicago so uh we it, it's it's so funny how everything works so uh Jed is like he's like he works with so many different artists from around the world and he happens to produce or record one of uh, sri lankan artists where i i'm originally from sri lanka uh he recorded some of the band and then that band was on my podcast and then i got into jed and then we we talked and um what i love about jed and i i also see that from you is although your christian musicians your your music is based on based on faith but you tend to have a very open mind about music your because jed for example works with like maybe works with death metal band or something that you know uh, in a regular sense they would consider christian like you know it shouldn't be a you shouldn't be associated with it but but jed is like very open minded about it and he 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 treat them as just art and music rather than trying to judge what the other bands are doing i i feel that you also have a very open mind what do you think about that Yeah, I would I would agree. Um, you know, I I I tend to think how can I say this? I almost don't believe in anything being secular. Right. Uh I think even even the the most death metal song, even if it's talking about Satan, there's there's a theological implication to the message that they're talking about, right? You can right. even kind of you can you can find god in the lack of god or you can you know you can you can find something spiritual everywhere and to me there's nothing more spiritual than than music itself um to be honest music is really what i think what helped launch my faith uh i think i think playing guitar in church and using music to connect with god um that that was the primary um 
kind of tool for me to be able to express uh, a, a spirituality. And I continue to, to see that art form as a very spiritual thing. And, and I don't like drawing lines between something being spiritual or, or secular. Um, and, uh, you know, a band like Mumford and Sons, you know, you can listen to their music and think, this is, this is like church music, you know, this right. is like a very spiritual <clears throat> theme. Um, and that's kind of, that's the kind of music that I like to create as well. That um, is kind of for everyone, but can, can point us to the deeper truths of, of life and, and kind of wrestling with the deeper questions. <clears throat> yeah. Um... That I, I, I used to go to, before the pandemic, uh, we used to have, a, uh, especially around Easter, there would be a, sort of a Christian music festival here that would have like a foreign act would come. Um, I've seen, I've been to that, uh, that festival a couple of times and uh, I've seen like Switchfoot, you know, the band Switchfoot and then Mute oh, yeah. Math, the other one was Mute Math. And there were other like kind of sort of, uh, I think sometimes these bands doesn't like them to be categorized as Christian bands or something, but I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that because uh, their songs are based about, you know, a great good message and great message about music, right? Um, and I, what I realized from the podcast, because I had so many people that, so many bands and artists on my podcast that, um, there is a big music industry which is related to faith, faith-based music, right? It's not maybe it's not the the mainstream what we see on the you know on the TV and radio, but there is a big community and there's a lot of things are happening on the Christian music scene, right? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's definitely a it's definitely a big industry, and and to be honest, I've um, I think one of the reasons why I've been hesitant to want to just consider myself a, a CCM, contemporary Christian musician, uh, is because, I don't know, I, I, I can see, I, I, I might sound like kind of critical about this, but it is, it is an industry. It's, it's a, you know, it's a product. And I think, you know, um, our spiritual walk <laughs> it should not be something that we're making money off of but i do think that our our faith does inspire music and music inspires faith um so i i appreciate bands like switchfoot and mute math and um who can create songs that are very personal to them because they are people of faith but then you know you can hear it on like a a rock a secular rock station, a, as well. Um, so I, I feel like I, I have my my music kind of has a couple personas. Mm. There's like the songs I write for my worshiping community, which is the, our church, and those songs do feel much more like a Hillsong or yeah. a Bethel or a, you know one of those types of songs, but there is a, there's a reason because the reason that you, that songs are simple is because the point is the participation. So right. for me, the point of that song is to allow the people gathered to be able in, to engage with you. And, and for me, that's what it's about. It's not about trying to necessarily commercialize it but it's about that experience together. Um, so that's why, yes, there's going to be some more rep repetition and kind of simple simplicity. But my goal is to also be a little bit more deeper than just repeating the same words over and over again, but to really kind of dive into the scripture and try to be a little bit more in depth with the, the topic or, um, you know, with the language. And so uh, right now I'm, I'm currently putting out songs that are 
praise and worship songs that we do at, at Faith Bridge. And so the point of that, again, is really, uh, these are songs that have come out of this community and um, are songs that are helping us, you know, remember kind of what we're here to do, what we're here to be about. And those songs are very different than um, the full album I put out, um, I guess it was last year in 2020, um, called 13, right. which um, is kind of a blend. Like there's a couple songs that could be church songs, but for the most part, this is an album of, of love songs that I had written for my wife and for my kids and it was an album about love and it was just deeply personal for me because it was um, kind of my, a creative outlet for me to express love in a, in a variety of, of ways with these 13 songs. And so I, I yeah. kind of see that as a different, a different project with a different goal than, you know, the album that I'm kind of putting out a few songs at a time right now, which is, there's like, songs that I wrote with the worshiping community in mind. There's songs that I wrote for my family. And a lot of times those are also really fun to play out when I'm like doing, playing at bars and restaurants around town, you know, because people love to hear, you know, love songs and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. One of the songs from the album 13 is, uh, there's a song called Here. Hmm. Tell me about that song because I, I felt that was very personal, very special song. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I've got five kids. Um, I wrote here, you know, so, so for, for people who have had a, a child, there is this kind of honeymoon uh, when you first come home from the hospital and you've got this tiny little baby and you just you just look at this little baby and you just you're like I know that I'm gonna love you forever <laughs> and and so it was that feeling of like I would do anything for this little baby um, and so and then having kind of having that and then plus toddlers around and and thinking about them growing up um, you know, I, the message I wanted to tell my kids is that whatever happens in this life, whatever happens to you, whatever happens between us, like, I'm going to be your dad, I'm going to be here. And nothing can ever change that that relationship. And, I, you know, I want to show up and, and be here for you through the good and through the bad. And and even on, you know, and then I kind of get into the spiritual side of things of like, you know, this type of love lasts longer than a lifetime. Right, right. <clears throat> Kyle, uh, you, you actually released a book, audio book, or book uh, called Meditations from the Mount, right? So, I mean, it's, I feel that it's related to your songs from the Mount. Uh, so, uh, why decide to put out a book? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, ha I had a, a friend, I have a friend who, uh, he, he, he basically, he and I and, and some others started this new thing. Uh, it's, it's basically a, a new theology school. It's basically a, a seminary, um, but slightly slightly different, you know, and, and there's, there's, there were several reasons for me that that was important at the time. Um, I, this is kind of a side note, but, you know, I had been reading a lot of books about um, the problem of um, race in, in America and, and prejudice and racism and hatred and all of this, you know, um, terrible things um, from the, our American history. And one of the one of the kind of side notes in this book was saying, you know, even 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 the, the best seminaries that we have, um, if you think about when they were started, you know, it, it, 
it, it's had to shift their thinking rather than being started with an understanding of true kind of racial justice. And, um, and so this, this author I was reading was saying like, we, we need more people to start seminaries. We need some new, uh, some new theology. And it was around that time that I had this friend named Jeff who was contacting me about this vision that he had had for years. Uh, and he, had, he has like four seminary degrees or something. Like he just was addicted to seminary. But then he had this idea to do something different, to offer this to a different set of people. Um, and really the point of it is to help people uh, wrestle with God in a new way and create something out of that experience to really um, have something to show for it. I mean, every kind of doc doctorate or a seminary degree, you, you kind of produce a, a piece of work, or a dissertation or something. So, so one, of the, one reason for this book was it, it was kind of like a dissertation for me. It was a little bit of a um, uh, part of this new theology degree that I was even kind of helping to craft. And when, so when he approached me and said, well, what, what is something that you already have spent a lot of time thinking about and working with? And, and what, what would you think about creating a book? And, I, and that was easy for me. I was like, well, you know, my last semester of seminary, I was just very, I felt very convicted that these words of Jesus don't get enough attention. You know, Christians tend to make Jesus an idol to be worshipped rather mm. than also a, a teacher to be followed. Uh, Jesus' words and teachings tend to get fallen by the wayside, and it's all about, um, it's, it's all about the, the blood sacrifice and atonement and forgiveness of sins. And I'm not downplaying that. I'm just saying... Jesus also teaches us a path to walk. And to me, that is, is really important to, to, to show. And, and even to say, whether or not you're a Christian, this, there's wisdom in these words. Like there's, right. there is a, a path of nonviolence, uh, a path of simplicity and joy and, you know, all, all of these, all of these things. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a passion of mine to to focus on these words, and so since I already had sixteen songs, I, it was it made sense for to basically make a chapter for each song, and and again, it's the book is not necessarily that well researched in a sense that I looked at a whole bunch of other people's thoughts about it. Uh, it was really more personal and from the heart, and and hopefully more of a the beginning of, of conversations for people to engage with these words for themselves. And, um, and hopefully people who engage with it can, can learn something that maybe they didn't even know this, that this was something that Jesus said. Um, but I, I, I also have, uh, so I've got the paperback version on, on Amazon, but what I'm really excited about is the, the audible version actually has the, the songs from the Mount built into it so you'll hear the 16 songs with the 16 chapters um put together into one project and i was really excited about that because that was kind of my initial vision was for those two things to come together so so this is available in audible right yes right <clears throat> uh kyle i saw one of your <laughs> i i don't know if it, it was your post or Rural Jam post, you guys posted the set list. It was three page set list of one of your shows. And I, 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 when I look at it, I know I can now relate to what you said about the 90s, about, you know, the grand you, because that set list was so amazing songs. You know, you yeah. <laughs> Tell me about yeah. this Kural, Kural Jam band. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, Squirrel Jam is a 90s cover band that I'm a part of. And how that got started, so, you know, after I, after I started recording the songs from the Mount and, and uh, I wanted to, 
kind of share my music more. I started playing out more, doing some bars and restaurants, uh, started playing my original music, but then also I would do a lot of covers. And a lot of the covers that I would do just happened to be from the 90s because that, that was the music I really kind of, you know, when I talk about the Beatles and all that, I feel like that was kind of my parents' music that I enjoyed. But right. then the 90s was like my music. You know, right. it was like when I came into my own and I was buying my first CDs and and choosing which radio stations to listen to. It was it was that nine those nineties rock, uh, guitar driven songs. And so, uh, actually, a, a a friend who at the time we weren't that close of friends. We were more of acquaintances. But he happened to to see me play uh, at a restaurant one time and. You know, it, it just struck him the amount of 90 songs I was playing. And then later that week, he told a, a, a friend of his, hey, we need to start a 90s cover band and get Kyle to be our front man. Uh, and so that was me, the, uh, the bass player and the other guitarist. And then they were like, we just need to find a drummer. And then so they knew, they knew kind of through other friends a great drummer. And so what was funny, it was four guys from four different churches, basically. Um, I, they, they approached me and I thought, this is a great idea. Like, I, I love this because um, it just sounded like something that would be really fun. Mm. So we, we, we got together and started learning songs and, you know, it, it was fun, but what, and so, and we still, we still do this, um, you know, Squirrel Jam is the band if you want to hear 90s rock music. Um, we've, we've been able to play some really fun venues um, and weddings and parties and restaurants and bars, you know, and around here in, in Boone, it's, there's, not a, there's not a huge, um, there's not a lot of venues for original music. It's mostly mm. kind of like you're playing it, you're playing as kind of background music to sell more food and alcohol. Uh, right. So in those settings, they really would prefer to hire a band like Squirrel Jam because they know everyone's going to love the songs that are familiar. And so, so Squirrel Jam really does get, you know, good gigs. But even, even with this band, what I, what I soon realized for all of us, uh, every once in a while, what during, during, times when we would get together and rehearse I would teach the guys a song that I had just written and uh, we would love it it was so much fun playing something new and original and and again my heart is is as a singer songwriter like covers are fun but it's not like fulfilling in the same way as doing something that I had written and so um, especially when when the pandemic hit and then there was no live music, the, uh, the four guys, we, we still wanted to get together. And so we really started focusing more and more on original mm. stuff. And so that was when we started thinking, you know, we've got something special here. Like we, we have a great time playing nineties music, but when we play our music, we come alive in a different way it feels like we're not trying to be, we're not trying to sound like Nirvana or Pearl Jam right now. We're trying to sound like us and this feels really good and right. And so what came out of that is the band called Seeking Gravity. Right. So it's the exact same four guys, <laughs> but Seeking Gravity is all original music. Right. Yeah, because what I felt about Seeking Gravity, it, it looked so it, it, it sounded more modern band, like it, like, you know, uh, that, that's what I felt up from the music videos that you had and the songs you had. And uh, it was sort of a new, it, it can be with the new up and coming artists, right? Like the people like listen to these days. So, um, what's happening with Seeking Gravity? I know you had a song called Soul Show, I believe, and War I, I, I listened to another one, Warfare Within, I believe, that's the other song. So what's that's happening right. with Seeking 
what's happening with seeking gravity. Yeah, so so that that's right. You you have named both of our singles. Uh, so I appreciate you finding those. We've got two singles out right now. The first one was called Soul Show, and the second one, Warfare Within. Um, and those are just two of a 15 song album that we are in the in the process of, of recording and getting out there and the actually we're we're about to release our third single within the next few weeks and it's called magic uh so we're you know we're on spotify apple music all of those places where you can stream things uh seeking gravity is also on instagram and facebook um but yeah so it was cool for me to release soul show as our very first song for a couple significant reasons i mean we like the song we think it's catchy it's, it has a little bit of a pop punk feel to it um it the meaning behind it though for me is you know especially in the midst of you know all of this was coming out during the pandemic and we kind of feel so isolated and alone. But Soul Show is about like trying to, to find uh, and experience deep, meaningful relationships. So having not just small talk, but actually being real with someone to a point of like, you know, showing your soul. In other words, revealing who you really are, how you're really feeling. Uh, even if that's very vulnerable and, and hard to do. And then kind of having someone be willing to like see it, but not judge you and not dismiss you, but embrace you for who you are. And uh, what, I, what I thought was really cool about releasing that as the first song with Seeking Gravity is, and this is really important, I think, for any band, you know, the music is awesome. But what really is going to help our band be successful is that we have these relationships between the four of us and it's meaningful. You know, when we right. come together, uh, we're not just making music like we're we actually care about each other, you know, and we, we end up having really great conversations sometimes. And so it's, it's, it's cool for me for that to be the first song that we put out. And again, we're not. So Seeking Gravity, it's, it would be kind of like a switch foot in a sense that we're not marketing this as Christian or spiritual at all, but it is very spiritual, you right. know, and I, I, and I think it's going to be obvious. People are going to pick up on that, uh, but if they don't, that's okay too. Like, I hope they also, I hope people can just enjoy uh, this music. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, a lot of these songs that I wrote for Seeking Gravity I wrote them before this band, before Squirrel Jam even existed. Um, as a songwriter, I had been writing a lot of songs that were, some were kind of sappy, some for, you know, some for, ch um, for church and for worship. But I, I remember thinking, I mean, this was probably 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. I was really thinking like, it's interesting that I don't necessarily write as many songs that are like the songs that I actually love to listen to in my car. <laughs> and so I just, I didn't have any plans for how, what was going to happen, but I just decided I'm just going to start writing some rock songs because that's the type of music I like to listen to. And so then I just had these songs in my back pocket and then I started teaching them to our squirrel jam guys and it just like fit us so well. Uh, it's just so funny how things, you know, sometimes you do things and you don't know why you do them. And then you realize years later, well, maybe that was, that was why I wanted to do this. There, there's a, there was some reason for that. Um, and so uh, now I'm very glad that I did. And so a lot of those songs are coming, are on this, this first album, uh, which will be called Seeking Gravity, kind of self-titled album. Uh, and that that name that name is is kind of cool because you know we, of course we had a hard time coming up with it's it's so hard to come up with a name right. you know, we, we make a list of like a hundred and uh but but we like it because 
it, it feels like, you know, this, this idea of seeking, seeking to be grounded, seeking to, to have your feet firmly on the ground to like somehow know how to, to keep walking and to, and to keep going. Uh, even though it feels like the rug keeps getting pulled out from under us. Um, it also, it just seems significant to me to talk about seeking something that we always have. Um, and I think that to me is a very spiritual thing to say is like so much of our seeking uh, is really something that we just have to wake up to realize we ha already have. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the album itself is very conceptual there's kind of an arc to the songs and it really kind of uh, tells us, tells the story of how we go through change, how we um, kind of lose and fall and fail and fall apart. And that's when we are made new and we can kind of begin again. And, you know, we can embrace our questions because questions kind of keep us curious and keep us seeking and, uh, and there's hope in that. And, and so that's, that's kind of the, the kind of overarching theme of the whole album. Right. It, it will be funny, right? Like if you, if you, if you get booked to play in a venue, you can basically book Seeking Gravity and Squirrel Jam at the same time because it's the same people, same guys, right? <laughs> We've joked about that. We joked about like just having having like two two different outfits that we would put on. And, right. uh, yeah, it, yeah, we'd be like, oh yeah, you know, we, we're Squirrel Jam. Stick around for Seeking Gravity. We so, we ran into those guys backstage. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 Kyle, uh, telling uh, to tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, what happens to the pandemic? So. Uh, I, I've been a big music fan. I what I used to what I do before the pandemic is I go to a lot of concerts and you know I, that was my life completely. Um, and what happened is when the pandemic happened in early 2020, I couldn't go anymore to any concerts or gigs. So so I I, I kind of got stuck and it was just work from home. That's it. And I kind of got depressed actually in the beginning. Um, but then I thought of uh, maybe talking to some friends about, you know, maybe just do Zoom calls with my friends about, you know, all these experiences we had and sort of reminiscing all the, all the great shows that we went to. And then I realized that maybe these conversations I'm having with these friends would be, can other people can also relate to this conversation. So that's where this podcast actually started. So so then I started talking to bands and artists and then it eventually it, it grew up and what we are recording is basically the 150th episode of this podcast. So it's like over, over more than a year now. And um, I, I started it as a, a sort of a personal coping mechanism to definitely that's, well, that's probably what I say. But while I'm doing that and while I'm talking to more, more, more artists, I, I found a purpose because uh, I found a purpose where I really helping artists to put out their message and story, which, which they wouldn't be able to put out. So I'm really helping a lot of artists. So I, I found a purpose. So I kept on doing it. Um, and so I'm really, uh, really found this purpose of from the podcast. Um, I know that you also have a podcast that, uh, and you, I, I saw a couple of episodes that you posted in YouTube that you interviewed this amazing sort of character. So can you tell me about the podcast and some of the guests you had? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually really new to the podcasting thing. I just started this year. And um, the, the theme actually comes from one of the songs off of my album called 13. And the song is called Still Figuring It Out. Right. And that song, you know, that song was one of the ones, uh, so, so the, that album is over, thir I wrote these 13 songs over like a period of about 13 years. Um, it was actually our 13th wedding anniversary when I, when I was putting this album out. So that was uh, why it was very focused on that number. 
Um, right. But one of the more recent songs that I had written was called Still Figuring It Out. And it was this idea. I mean, I was in my mid to late 30s and I had gotten, you know, seminary degrees. I had done lots of things and, and read a lot of books and had a lot of wisdom shared with me. And um, but this idea that I'm still figuring it out really resonated with me because, um, you know, figuring out how to live a life of love, uh, how to live well is a lifelong journey. And so this idea of still figuring it out, I thought, you know, that really would make, for one, it may, it's, it's basically like my personal theme song. <laughs> and right. for two, it would make a great podcast. And so I'd had this idea for a while and uh, eventually just decided to, to do it, to just go for it. And, um, you know, I've, I've interviewed a few, a few people and, and like you, I, it just starts with, with people, you know, friends of yours that have inspired you and have taught you something about what it means to, to live well. Um, so a few of the people I've interviewed, um, one, my friend, Alex, Alex has an incredible journey of suffering from, you know, trauma and addiction and mental illness leading to, you know, this drug addiction leading to, to crime, leading to prison time, leading to gang activity. Wow. Uh, you know, all of, all of this uh, kind of things that it's just remarkable to hear him to, to describe. But what's really remarkable is how he was able to completely turn his life around to get clean and sober and to now be a person who's helping other people, you know, out of addiction and, you know, help. he's uh, has been helping us with our, a recovery ministry at our, at our church. Um, you know, just, just one of those kind of miraculous transformation type stories that uh, is just a really inspirational person. I've got another friend who's a professional runner and he was competing to, to go to the Olympics. And so right. uh, while the Olympics were going on, I, I got to have a zoom conversation with him and, and share. He also had overcome just amazing adversity of uh, having uh, Achilles tendon surgery twice. And, you know, no one has overcome that and had been able to really compete um, the way he has. Um, and then another person who, named Janet, who is, um, she's an older lady who is a nurse and is, you know, we, we jokingly call her St. Janet at our church because uh, she, you know, just really seems like just a saint of a person. And she's more of just a, a person who loves to give, loves to, to um, just share the joy that she's found in life. And just has a lot uh, to offer in that way. And so, you know, these are people who all have taught me different things in different ways. Uh, and I've got a whole long list of other people that I'm going to be talking to. Uh, because you can, you know, I think everybody has something to, to, to teach us. And sometimes we just don't take the time to, to listen to other people's perspectives or, or their life journey. And, and more, more than me being able to tell someone some good information, I think letting people's lives speak for themselves is, is really, really important to me. Um, and, and for us to know that we're all still figuring it out. Like no one's perfect. No one's got it all figured out. But the more people that we're in conversation with, you know, the more we can encourage each other to, to keep working, to, to keep trying to figure it out. Uh, and right. I don't always interview people. Sometimes, sometimes it's just me sharing about something that I'm been thinking about, or or something that I, uh, uh, a creative project that I've been working on, or the theme to one of my songs, you know. And that that's also fun because you know, the song itself as a piece of art can can convey so many messages, but it's also fun to be able to talk a little bit deeper about what all I was thinking and what all comes up from, uh, from my point of view about that topic or issue. Right. 
yeah because what i felt is like nowadays <clears throat> with google and internet there's there's enough information there's if you want to find something out there's it, it's easy it's very easy like bit of a second but uh, all this information that we have i think there should be a deeper conversation of you know different perspective of it and how people apply these things to their lives and how they use their use it for their benefit you know so so i i i also see with the podcasting and all this uh, audio sort of things there are a lot of there's a big appetite now with people for deep conversations right deep this is not like just polished uh, tv shows it's just like a real people talking about them and sometimes they might not say the right thing they might not you know it because it's all personal it's it's what they feel and i think from that people actually i feel people learn from those those sort of conversations than just putting out the information and say oh, follow this right i i feel that that is a very good uh, sort of uh, direction now in the world right totally totally and i've i've learned so much more through friendship than i have just reading re- researching articles i right. mean you know it you can you can get information that way but it it affects you differently when you see something lived and you right. you see you see what someone has actually experienced and gone through right so so Kyle what's your message to the viewers of this podcast or listeners to this podcast you know i think the the first the th- the first message i i started off my podcast with um was all about curiosity and you know i just think staying curious is so important because this life is fascinating um there is so much to learn there is so much wisdom to be gleaned um and we we should never there there's never any reason to be bored um as a matter of fact i think we're over entertained a lot and that can stifle our curiosity um but to me keeping keeping that curiosity alive helps us keep the wonder alive and that wonder um leads to awe and a reverence for for life and uh gratitude and you know this idea that that this is all a gift you know at this this moment this life it's it's a gift and it's something to not take for granted and so that's you know if i could say anything it, it would it would be that you know keep keep going on on the journey uh even if it's really dark even if it's really tough right now um just keep going you know one of the songs that we do uh with seeking gravity it's called tunnels and the 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 main line is that there's a light for every tunnel so whatever whatever you're going through there is a light at the end but you have to keep you have to keep going Right. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other, taking that next step. Yeah, it's it's definitely a gift because that's why they call it the present, right? So that's right. So it's, yeah. So 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 Kyle, anybody you want to shout out to? Oh man, well I'm just so grateful for uh, my family and friends who just love me and support me. Um, my band guys. um Jed uh, Jed also did all of the mixing mastering production for my album 13 and the praise and worship songs that I'm that I'm currently releasing um he's such a talented wonderful friend to have um so uh, yeah so so many so many people but um my my church family at faith bridge i'm just so grateful that i'm able to 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 show up every sunday to bring some music sometimes to bring a sermon um and to just have that community of people who are continuing to to 
figured out with me as well. Right. So, so Kyle, I, I really enjoy talking to you. And I, I know we were supposed to do this last week, but uh, luckily it happened today. And I'm, I, I, I'm really enjoyed the conversation and I really appreciate what, what you were saying and all this inspiration you're giving. Um, and I'm looking forward to, you know, your new music. I, 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 as you said, there will be a new album from Seeking Gravity. And um, I wish you all the best with, with all, your, all, your work, all your stuff, all your aspirations. And uh, stay safe. And uh, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this. This has been a, it's been a fun conversation. And it's so good to, to meet you. Yeah. So, so Kyle, lastly, tell everyone how they can connect with you on social media. Yeah, I'm on um, Instagram, Facebook. Um, KyleSigmund.com is also my website. So you can find all the links there. That might be the, the best way uh, to find me. It's just my name, KyleSigmund.com. Uh, of course, all my music's on Spotify and Apple Music and Google and YouTube and Amazon and I don't even know how many places it's on, but it's probably <laughs> on all of them. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, so I'm, I'm grateful for um, anybody who's willing to check out any of the stuff I'm putting out there. The podcast is also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google and Amazon. Uh, the book is on Amazon and Audible, uh, maybe some other places too. Um, but again, it's all on my website, so that might be the, the easiest thing. Right. Yeah, that, I, I heard that there, there are like 200 streaming sites already in the world. So I don't know. I only know like five or six, but they, they said there's like 200. Yeah. So uh, just want to thank everyone who's been supporting this podcast because this, this is the 150th episode. So uh, the audience has grown for like 72 countries. I, I don't know where, it's like so many different places, so many different people. So just want to thank, and Kyle, thanks again for joining and thanks everyone for listening. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, thanks guys.